Hi there, boys and girls. Welcome to tonight's vodcast on plants. We're going to discuss the classification of plants and also the structures and the functions of them. In addition, we're going to review plant cell structure that we talked about earlier this year. And when we discussed cell structure earlier this year, we compared them to animal cells. And what we found and learned is that plant cells have three organelles that animal cells do not. Here on the left, they're listed as chloroplasts, cell wall, and large vacuole. Now the chloroplasts are located up here at the top, and they are the green organelles that sit inside of the cytoplasm of the plant, and that's what makes plants green. And chloroplasts are important because they carry out photosynthesis to make food. So they have a special pigment called chlorophyll inside of them to help them carry out this process to make food. Next we have the cell wall located all around the cell. And the cell wall is important because, just like any other type of wall, is going to offer protection to the cell, structure for the cell, and support for the cell. And then lastly, we have the large vacuole in the middle. And the large vacuole is like a storage closet for the cell. So inside the cell, the large vacuole is going to store water, glucose, waste, and other materials. So now that we've reviewed the plant cell structures, let's move on to the classification of plants. So when we take a look at plants and we analyze the kingdom, plantae, that they belong to, we see that plants are divided into two major groups. One group is called the non-vascular plants, and the other group is called the vascular plants. Now, as we learned in the cardiovascular system, cardio meant heart, and vascular means vessels. So the plants that are called non-vascular plants are plants that do not contain vessels. One example of a non-vascular plant that you might be familiar with is moss. And normally when you find moss, it's in a wet, damp area. And when you see moss, it doesn't grow tall at all. It's usually a very short growth on logs or rocks. And the reason why it is so short and small is because they do not have the vessels to transport water to great heights like trees and other tall plants do. So they're very simplistic plants. And plants have evolved into vascular plants. And vascular plants are the plants that do have these tube-like structures. And these tube-like structures include two tubes that we're going to learn about later, phloem and xylem. That's what you'll find in vascular plants. So when we take a look at our vascular plants, we can also see that they get broken down into two subgroups. We have plants that are called seedless plants, which reproduce by using reproductive structures called spores. And one example that you might know of are ferns. Ferns don't make seeds. They release spores into the air, and these spores fall into the ground and germinate into a new plant. The other group of plants that we have are seed plants. Seed plants are pretty self-explanatory. These are the plants that produce seeds to make new organisms. And if we take a look at our seed plants, we can divide our seed plants into the last two categories that we're going to discuss. Our seeded plants can include plants called gymnosperms and angiosperms. Now the major difference between a gymnosperm and an angiosperm is their flowering ability. Gymnosperms do not flower, whereas angiosperms do flower. So one example of a gymnosperm that you're very familiar with here on Long Island because we have a whole forest of them in the middle of it and even here in East Hampton called the Pine Barrens are pine trees. And as we know, pine trees don't have flowers on them, but in order to reproduce, they do have reproductive structures and these reproductive structures are called pine cones. Our angiosperms are the main types of plants that we're going to discuss today in this podcast. And as I said, they are flowering plants, so they produce flowers. Since they do produce flowers, their seeds are located in fruits. And such fruits include apples, pea pods, and oranges. So if we take a look at, at an example here, I have a picture of this orange tree. And these oranges come from fertilized flowers that grew on the plant. So when these flowers blossom and they get pollinated by the pollen in the air, those flowers will then turn into oranges. All right, so let's take a look at angiosperms, their structures, and their functions. Now, angiosperms can have four main structures to them. The top structure everybody probably knows is called a flower. Next, we have these 
large flat green structures called leaves. And these leaves are attached to a long stalk that supports the plant called a stem. And then lastly, the parts that we don't see are the ones that are buried underground, and these are the roots of the plant. Now each structure here has a different job and different function to it. So if we take a look, we'll start off with the flower first. The flower's main job is to be the reproductive structure of the angiosperm. So when seeds are made, it's in the flower. And as a result, when the flower gets fertilized, the flower will then turn into a fruit, and inside the fruit, we have seeds. And we'll talk more about flower reproduction and fruit development in the next vodcast. Now I'm just going to go over the different structures on the flower, but we'll get more in depth into these structures when we talk about seeds and how they form and so forth. Flowers can either be male, female, or both. And you have two major categories of structures here. You have the stamen on the left here, and then you have the pistil on the right. The stamen is the male portion of the flower. And that's easy to remember because the last three letters of stamen spell out men. So that's the male portion of the flower, whereas the pistil is on the right here. And that's the female structures. So the stamen include the pollen, which encase sperm cells, and the pollen is produced by the anther, and the anther is held up by the filament. Now the pistil has more structures to it. We have the stigma at the top of the tube, and the stigma is supposed to catch pollen, the style is the tube that leads from the stigma to the ovary, which is found at the bottom of the flower. And inside the ovary, we have ovules, which are structures that contain the eggs. Now, if we take a look at the next structure, the leaves of a plant, we'll notice that they're broad and they're flat. And one easy way to remember their function is just to take a look at their shape and think of solar panels. So in the leaves, since they're broad and they're flat, and they're green, that means they contain a lot of chloroplasts. And those chloroplasts are used for photosynthesis. And the reason why the leaves are broad and flat is because they're trying to catch as much sunlight as possible and absorb that sunlight to create glucose and oxygen. Now we'll talk about guard cells and stomata in a little bit, but we have guard cells and stomata on the bottoms of the leaves and they act as doorways to allow gases such as carbon dioxide into the leaf and oxygen out of the leaf as well as water vapor. So let's take a closer look at what a leaf looks like. Okay, so whenever we take a look at a leaf, it just looks like a, a thin, flat structure on a plant. And it doesn't look like there's very much to it. We might see veins running through the leaves, but really that's about all we see. Well, the leaves don't have to be that big because if they get too big, they're too heavy, and they won't stay as flat as they possibly can to absorb as much sunlight as they can. But if you cut a leaf in half, you're going to see all these different structures on them. At the top here, you have the cuticle, which is a waxy structure, so that's why some leaves are shinier than others. And you'll notice that the tops of the leaves are a little more glossy than the bottoms of the leaves. The bottoms of the leaves are a little dull in color. And the cuticle's function is to prevent water loss because the plant doesn't want to lose water. And then the outer layer of cells that we have is called the epidermis, just like our skin. The outer layers of our cells of our skin is called the epidermis. And underneath the epidermis, you have this thick layer called the palisades layer. And you'll notice in these long structures in the palisades layer, there's a bunch of little speckles and dots. Well, these are chloroplasts. So the palisades layer is chock full of chloroplasts, which means the function of the palisades layer is to photosynthesize with all these chloroplasts. Now underneath the palisades layer, we have the spongy layer. And the spongy layer is just filled with air spaces, just like a sponge is. And this is where oxygen comes out of the cells and carbon dioxide goes into the cells, kind of like how gas exchange goes on in our lungs. And at the bottom of the leaf, you can see we have the guard cells and we have the stoma, or plural, called the stomata. The guard cells act as doormen for the leaves. Now, the guard cells will open and close, and when they open up, they allow gases to enter, such as carbon dioxide, and they allow oxygen to leave. And the stoma is just the space. That's all it is. It's just the opening or the hole inside of the bottom of the leaf. And lastly here... In the middle, we have this vein, and this is also known as the vascular bundle. And this is where we have the vessels called xylem and phloem flowing through. 
but let's take a look at a cross section of a real leaf and see what it actually looks like. So this is our cross section of an actual leaf and I'm just going to label the parts to show you what they actually look like in real life. So this is a microscope slide that's been stained so we can see the different structures of it. So number one is the vascular bundle. So as we said, vascular means vessels and bundles means bunched together or grouped together. So this is where your xylem vessels and phloem vessels are located. Number two, we have our outer layer of cells here, just like our skin has an outer layer. This is called the epidermis. Derm refers to skin, so that's why dermatologists, the skin doctors, call the dermatologist. So that's an easy way to remember that this outer layer is like the skin, so it's the epidermis. Underneath the epidermis, we have these tall, long cells with all these dots in them that are chloroplasts, and this is our palisades layer. Okay, and then down below the palisades layer, you'll notice that we have a lot of open air space here, a lot of air pockets, just like a sponge. So this is going to be our spongy layer. And then along the lower epidermis here, at some point, you're going to see an opening or a gap inside of the leaf. And this is where you'll find your guard cells and stoma. So number five refers to the space, which is called the stoma. So remember, stoma space. And then on the sides here, we have one here and one there. These are the guard cells. So again, as we said before, gases such as carbon dioxide will enter through the stoma, get into the spongy layer, and diffuse throughout the spongy layer. And then, obviously, these gases are going to make their way all the way up to the palisades layer and into these cells that also have chloroplasts in them. And the carbon dioxide will go into the cells, get into the chloroplasts, be used for photosynthesis to make sugar. And as a result, and as we said before, as a waste gas, whatever extra oxygen that the plant cells do not use, the plant cells release the oxygen out of the leaf as well. So out comes the O2, and in goes the CO2. So these air spaces allow the gases to diffuse easily to get to the cells to make photosynthesis happen. Okay, so those are the structures of our leaf. So the third structure we're going to discuss is the stem. And the stem is made up of three different types of tissues. The three types of tissues that we have inside of the stem are called xylem, phloem, and cambium. Now we've mentioned xylem and phloem a couple of times, so this is what they actually do. First of all, Water needs to get from the roots of the plant all the way up to the flower and to the leaves. This way the cells can use them to carry out photosynthetic reactions and other chemical reactions that needs water. Our xylem tubes are the structures that carry the water through the plant. However, plants are living things, so they do need to make energy. And in order to make energy, they need glucose. All the cells in the roots and in the lower parts of the stems and the upper part of the stem and in the flower, they need the food. Well, food is easy to remember because it starts off with that F sound, just like phloem does. So I always remember phloem is food. And then cambium. Cambium is the tissue that makes the xylem and the phloem. The best way I can suggest that you remember it, because this is how I remember it, I know that cambiar in Spanish is the word to change. I know cambium sounds like cambiar. The cambium changes into xylem and phloem. So the cambium is the tissue that produces xylem and phloem inside the stems of the, of the plant. Those are what the stems are made up of. However, the stem also has a function. And the function of the stem is to provide support for the leaves. This way, they're high up in the plant as possible, so they can be closer to the sun and absorb as much sunlight as they possibly can, and for the branches as well. And they also keep the plant upright, because if the plant's wilting over or on the ground, it can get outcompeted for sunlight, which is what the plant wants. Now, there are different types of stems for different types of plants, so let's take a look at what they are. 
All right, so the two types of stems that you could find in an angiosperm are called herbaceous stems and woody stems. The difference is pretty easy to remember. Herbaceous stems, I always remember herb. Herbs tend to be soft. So your herbaceous stems are the types of stems that hold up these flowers. So as you walk through Herrick Park and you saw one of those dandelion puffballs sitting in the middle of the grass and it's nice and tall, you might have gone over and kicked it and kick the plant out of the ground, all right? And the reason why you're able to kick the plant out of the ground is because your foot was able to go through the stem. So the stem here is a soft, fleshy material that supports the plant. And inside the stem, as you can see, we have our xylem cells that, that carry water, and we have our phloem cells that carry the food. However, if you try to pull that with a tree, you notice that you probably will jam a toe, break a toe, break your foot. Regardless, hurt yourself pretty bad. So stems and trees are called woody stems, and that's easy to remember because, as we know, the tree trunks, which are the stems for trees, are made up of wood. And if you've ever taken a look at the tree rings of a tree that's been cut down or anything, you'll notice that there are different lines that make those rings. Those rings are made up of xylem. So the word xylem is actually pointing to the light rings or each layer. Every spring, there is new xylem that's being formed inside the tree, and that's why there's a different ring. That's why we use the rings to count how many years it's been alive. So if you see 30 rings, that the tree has been 30 years old and created xylem 30 times for each spring that, that it's been alive. And we can actually tell the differences between whether it was a dry season or whether it was a wet season by looking at the width of the ring. If there's a lot of xylem, that means there's a lot of water, so it must have been a wet season. If there's a thinner ring, there wasn't as much water, and there's less xylem made. And if we take a look at the phloem, the phloem is just on the inside of the bark. These are the two types of stems that we have. They're herbaceous stems, and then you have your woody stems. And that brings us to our last structure of angiosperms. The last structure that we're going to discuss are the roots. The root's main job is to absorb water and nutrients from the soil, and we're going to discuss the different structures it has to do that. However, they also provide anchorage to prevent the plant from being blown away by the wind. And if you've ever tried to pull some plants out of the ground, some are a little more difficult to rip out of the ground than others, and it's because of their roots. However, a third function of the root is to store food. Starch is stored in structures like potatoes. Potatoes are actually grown underground, and they're called tubers, which are these big storage compartments that are grown on the root. If you eat a beet or if you eat carrots, you have, you're eating the roots of these plants that have stored starch in them. So let's take a look at different types of roots and the structures that go with them. Now there are two different types of roots that I want to discuss. First type of root we have are called fibrous roots, and they sound exactly like the name says. The fibrous roots are located here at the bottom of these scallion onions, and they look like fibers that hang off the edges of them. And the second kind of root is called the taproot. A taproot is essentially one large root down the center, and it has little root hairs growing off of them and smaller roots growing off the edges of them. So if you've ever eaten a carrot before, you've eaten a taproot. Now, even though these roots spread out in the ground to absorb the water that they need, to maximize the amount of water that they absorb, they actually have little structures called root hairs. So if we take a look down here, you'll notice that we have our root, which is this large thick structure here, but on the edges of the root, it looks like it's got a bunch of hair on it. And these are called the root hairs. And the root hairs increase the amount of water that gets absorbed into the root. So instead of water just being absorbed straight into the main root, we're gonna get lots of water being absorbed in all these root hairs that will then get transported to the main root, and then that water will get sent up the root to the plant, through the stem, up to the leaves, and then the flower. And when we take a look at a cross section of a root, we'll see the vascular bundle here. So we're gonna see the xylem cells, and in the roots, the xylem cells are usually easy to spot because they're larger, and they look like the letter X. So here are your xylem cells in the middle there, and then you have your phloem cells down there. They usually look like circular bundles of cells. Well, boys and girls, that concludes our vodcast on the classification, structures, and functions of angiosperms. Thank you very much.